Hello, I'm Terry David Mulligan. This is the Mulligan's 2 podcast. This is a special edition. It's a celebration of Chris Christopherson, who we lost just a couple of days ago. This is a slightly edited version of the Mulligan's 2 podcast 143, which I think we ran in 2014, but it's an interview that we did backstage at the Calgary Folk Festival in 2006. Somebody came running up as I was doing an interview then in 2006 and said they're organizing a press conference for Chris backstage in 15 minutes. Can you get over there? (laughs) And I went running, turned on my microphone, put it on the seat beside me. Here's what we talked about. Because the questions are covered up by other bands playing on stage around us, so you can hear all of that noise and some of the questions get washed out. But Chris is going to talk about (laughs) landing his helicopter on Johnny Cash's front lawn and Cash coming out with a shotgun because he was a a pilot. The Johnny Cash movie. We talk about Festival Express in Calgary with Janice and Janice. We're going to talk about Janice quite a bit. What, What her career would have been like had she lived today. He's going to talk a lot about songwriting and Hank Williams and being a solo performer. He says it puts the focus on the songs. He is not a big fan of his voice or his stage presence. The hard part of choosing the songs that he's going to sing and the ones that he doesn't. Talks about politics, talks about the first character that he created when he first started singing, Chris Carson. Also, the uh, Nashville underground scene that he helped to start and changed Nashville. Bob Dylan once said Chris Christopherson came into Nashville like a wildcat that he was and just changed everything. You can look at Nashville pre-Chris and post-Chris. He was very politically charged. He would stand up for things that he believed in that cost him his career at times, but he did it anyway. He talks about the sons of the songwriters that he knows. His favorite singer, of course, is John Prine and Todd Snyder. But then he talks about Shooter Jennings, uh, John Carter, John Cash's son, Willie Nelson's kids, Luke and Micah. And he's nervous singing in front of the 12,000 people who are in attendance at the folk festival talks about that quite a bit. And finally, don't forget that Chris Christopherson was the guy who, when Sinead O'Connor was being booed on stage at Bob Dylan's birthday bash at Madison Square Garden, someone sent him on stage to pull her off. Instead, he leaned into her, he gave her a big hug, leaned into her ear and said, don't let the bastards get you down. That's who Chris Christopherson was. Here's some comments, random as they are with the late, great Chris Christopherson. Hey, dude, um, you look pretty good. Um, <laughs> Compared to what? <laughs> are you going to act? You're not going to act. Are you going to keep on acting? Or are you going to... Well, see, the difference between the acting and the performing in this is it's not up to me when I act. They have to hire me. They have to ask me to you do it. You also have to say yes. Well, yeah, um, but I'll tell you, as you get older and as you're politics get a little more unpopular in Hollywood you get uh, fewer offers and I'll probably act again somebody will probably find a good role for an old guy I I think my last couple of movies uh, uh, well they're not the last ones I did but Lone Star and uh, uh, Soldier's Daughter Never Cries are maybe the best I ever did you know the best acting but whether I'll act again is up to somebody else. You know, if they if they want a good old <laughs> old outlaw, you know, I'm up for grabs. But uh, but I'm not interested just in being a, in a movie because a lot of the movies I see today I don't even like. I like Pirates of the Caribbean though. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Obviously, uh, your, your career has had this real resurgence lately with the Don Waz records and whatnot. But a few years back, there was an entire generation of kids that I swear they only knew, they primarily knew you as Blade, Blade the Vampire Slayer's uh, Vampire Slam buddy. Did that, mm-hmm. that, that, did that ever get irksome or anything? Or well, I'll tell you, I was over in, in Sweden uh, about a year ago, maybe two. <laughs> they go by faster now. <laughs> but uh, uh, the guy who was interviewing me said well, he was standing out there at the sound check with a bunch of kids, and and they said Whistler sings. <laughs> 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 it was uh, I, that tickles me. 
you know. I, uh, I just, I, I'm just so uh, gratified that, uh, that it's so well received today. And again, I think that's uh, probably because, you know, they, uh, they appreciate Johnny Cash and uh, they appreciate the honesty of the music. And, and uh, God knows it's not the, the uh, vocal talent or, or, <laughs> or musical talent. But I think, I think they're, they're the same reason that, that Rick Rubin's uh, albums with John worked is what's working with the shows now. Well, I'm not gonna step on John's version of the story. <laughs> But he had a very creative imagination. But I did land on there. I, for a brief time uh, that year, I was in a National Guard and had to fly so many hours a month just to be current, you know, and, and I thought it'd be a good, I had already known John as his janitor for almost two years and pitched him every song I ever wrote. But he'd never cut one. He'd always tell Luther that he loved it, you know, and Luther, would come and tell me, but uh, I thought maybe it would catch his attention. Uh, I'm lucky he didn't shoot me out of the sky, because, uh, and, and it's come back to haunt me because nobody feels uh, that they could invade my privacy in a way that was more objectionable than that, you know. You and I uh, started a brief conversation at the Toronto Film Festival last uh, uh, about uh, Johnny Cash and about the film that was just about to be released. Neither one of us had seen it at that point. And you had hoped that they got it right. When you saw it, did they get it right? And more importantly, his legacy, his place in music seems as solid and secure as I've ever seen it. Yes, it is. I hear him on, on the radio more than ever, and he's selling more records than ever. And I was pleased with the, with what they did with that part of his life, which could be, it was probably the hardest to do without, without making people look bad, different ones. I know that Roseanne can't watch it because it was a very painful part of her life. But I thought the performances were great. I thought uh, Reese Witherspoon nailed June. It was just, and I think John would have been proud, you know, uh, Joaquin did a, a a good, respectful job, especially the fact that he sang. Right? Yeah. You know, that, uh, and T-Bone Burnett, my old friend, did real well on the music. You know, so I, I figured that that uh, John would have liked it, and I uh, I would like to see more f uh, flavors of his personality because I, I knew him all, always after that period of time. But uh, for the time period it was covering, I think it was accurate. By the way, one of the last great concerts that Janice ever did was here in Calgary. Oh, really? At the end of Festival Express, because they'd partied all across the country. I know. <laughs> and this is where it finished. Oh, right here, it I was supposed to be on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Actually, yeah, I know, I know. Uh, yeah, I, uh, unfortunately, I was starting uh, to play in clubs right at the same time, and I couldn't go. So Just, they, my mind goes back to that, and I think, where would she be today? What would she be doing? And what did we lose? Well, you know, she'd be like Ray Charles if he were alive today. You know, she was, Janice was a uh, uh, serious, gifted musician, artist. You know, she knew, uh, and she was smart. She's a very intelligent person uh, and funny, yeah. God knows what she'd be doing today, but I bet they'd be playing her all the time on the radio. The artist has to has to write about what he knows about, you know. And I and my concerns are the same as they've always been, you know. But freedom and uh, truth, honesty, and uh, humanity, you know. And I I always hope that I was that I was following in the footsteps of, of people like Hank Williams you know and to the stuff that he wrote under the or, or recorded under the name of Luke the drifter you know the social commentary and uh, but he did it in a way that it was it was presented 
very real and the impact on you was emotional and because it was real. Oh, freedom's got a lot of different meanings, yeah. you know. Uh, I, st I imagine it's still the same because it was represented many different things to me all the time. You know, it, it could be a blessing and a curse, but it definitely is what separated us from other animals, you know, as humans, I think. How could Chris Christopherson not believe that he could do a, like a, a solo acoustic album? Well, I'm not the greatest guitar player in the world, and, and uh, I surely don't have a, a voice like George Jones or Merle Haggard. Uh, I've been playing by myself now for about three years, and uh, it started kind of by accident, and then uh, it, it worked so well, I think because it puts a focus on the songs that's different from when you're playing with a band. I, I don't really tweak them too much <laughs> consciously because, I, as I said, I'm, I'm uh, pretty limited in, uh, in my technique. The, the best thing I can do is, is come as close to telling the truth up there on the stage as I can, and it usually just comes out however I'm feeling at the time. But it's, there's not a great variation in from show to show that I notice anyway. Maybe it's something only dogs can hear. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm used to doing about a two and a half hour show. So uh, it was uh, pretty drastic to start lopping them off. You know, it's like deciding which one of your kids <laughs> can come to Christmas, you know. You uh, I, I, I wanted to make a combination of the two that works out. Uh, I usually, like to feel like the whole show works uh, the dynamics of it so that it, that it uh, moves the audience in the, in the direction I'd like it to, to be moved. And so that, that, that takes in some social commentary, you know, and, uh, and some just the old, old uh, standard-like songs. I, I uh, have enough trouble just listening to what's going on, you know, south of your border. I hope the Canadians will not feel impelled to follow our example or to stand up for what we're doing these days, because I don't. And I've always felt that Canadians had a little more sense than we did, in recent history anyway. I think uh, my, as far as my political orientation, it's, it's 180 degrees from there. In those days, it was before I was in the Army, and after I did five years in the Army, and then another five trying to make it as a songwriter, I was influenced by news that didn't come in on the Stars and Stripes, you know, the, the only information in, uh, available to the military. Just over the years, I guess, I guess you're supposed to get more conservative as you get older, and I have gone just the other direction. Musically, I think the, the time that I spent in Nashville and the time I spent on the road after that has made me a better songwriter. Uh, when I was writing songs back when I was Chris Carson over in England, they were kind of like the songs that, that you heard on the radio in those days. The best of which were probably the Kingston Trio, but most of them were pretty dumb, you know, how much that doggy in the window and all things. And I was, I come to realize probably with the examples of Bob Dylan and the uh, writers that I admired in Nashville, like Mickey Newberry and Chris Gantry and some people like that, I'm glad it took me as long as it did to before I got out to be performing them because when I was Chris Carson, I didn't know anything. Uh, Chris, what is it about the festival setting that makes it so special to perform? Well, the ones that I've played at recently, like over in Ireland, it seems like everybody's, or if you go all the way back to Woodstock and places like that, people are open to what's happening now. They want to hear music. A lot of venues where you can play, it's not like that. This is just for the music. They're not trying to sell booze or or get people back into the casino, you know. I heard there's there's something like ten or twelve thousand people out there now. I don't know if that would scare you, but it scares me. <laughs>
I don't really feel like that kind of legend, to be honest. I, uh, I think that, you know, country tunes are fairly simple, and it's, and it's hard not to step on each other around there. I'm sure that uh, I was a little intimidated by Hank Williams when I started out, you know. But, uh, but I hope that, that the music and my music has inspired some people to, uh, to write uh, that kind of song. Because when I went to Nashville, there, were, there was kind of a Nashville underground there. Of, it was too small to really call an underground, but maybe a half dozen of us who used to hang out and really took the music seriously and were fighting for respect for country music that it now has, you know, and uh, we were part of that. And I'm proud of it, you know. I, I don't think my tunes are ever gonna scare anybody off. My words might. <laughs> what songwriters are appealing to you these days? Any new things that are happening in music that uh, is picking your ears up saying, wow, that's really something uh, I yeah, John Prine. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to be up here in yeah, September, yeah, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, he's, he's but uh, Todd Schneider. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid I'm having a senior moment because there's guys that I can think of their face and I can't think of their well, name. I like Shooter Jennings or any of the others. Oh, Shooter your, Jennings. On your new recording. <laughs> Shooter yeah. is really the apple didn't fall far from the tree. You know all the stuff that he got from Jesse and Waylon. Yeah is evident in, in his stuff and he gets every time I hear him he gets so much better yeah. he's uh, Waylon, Waylon is smiling somewhere right now <laughs> at how good he is in fact uh, John's son John Carter is grown into a great person I was, we were, but we were looking around the other day at all the my wife and I at uh, at the sons of people, Merle Haggard's son is recording. And Willie Nelson's kids, I swear Luke can sound like Jimi Hendrix or Willie himself. He sounded, and he plays a guitar, uh, electric lead guitar, and he's, and he's very young. I keep thinking of him as that young, but he's like 17 or 18, you know, and he's gonna be real good. And, and his son Micah as well. They both got a band and a new record out. So I like all their stuff, but I never did hear much once that I started on the road because I was so busy getting ready for the show. And I wonder what it's going to be like to go out in front of 12,000 people. <laughs> Chris Christopherson, backstage 2006 at the Calgary Folk Festival with a group of media just firing off questions. I'm going to leave the uh, final words to Margot Price who wrote a great article just after Chris died. The article was called Lighting a Candle for Chris Christopherson. Chris was, like the words of his song, The Pilgrim, Chapter 33, a poet, a picker, a prophet, a pusher, a pilgrim, and a preacher, and a problem when he was stoned. He was also a song crafter, storyteller, a movie star, a soldier, a helicopter pilot, an activist, a Rhodes Scholar, a Renaissance man, a father, a family man, a veteran, and a true blue American hero. We salute Chris Christopherson. This is The Stew. I'm Terry David Mulligan. Blue Moon Marquis is next. They have a new album, New Orleans Sessions. A.W. Cardinal, Al Cardinal on vocal and guitar. Jasmine Collette on vocals, bass, and drums on the stage of the Osborne Bay Pub in Crofton, Vancouver Island. It's their original stage where they met. We're sitting right on it. Here we go. The best spot in the house, the best seat in the house, is in fact on the stage. You must have played this stage before. We have indeed. We live in the area down the road, and this is uh, this is our local stomping ground. Yeah. It's, I, I, I was in here for P.J. Perry, so it was a jazz concert. What, what's the room like for you and acts like you coming in here? Well, it's one of, one of the greatest stages because you can have people that are sitting enjoying their dinner and drinks and then also have people up and dancing so i think it's really a great experience where you can have anybody is free to feel like they're they can do whatever they want to do you know and i love playing shows like that that's my favorite way to play um rather than just somebody just sitting there and staring at you intently at everything you do you know (laughs) and not saying the words along with you um when did you first come in here 
Oh, that's so. I used to live in East Van, and I played uh, in a rock and roll band with Paul Pagat and Wickham Porteous. Wow, man, you know that's that? a duo. <laughs> yeah, man, and uh, I play, and then I played side projects with a, a fellow named Wick- Wickham Porteous. Yep. Um, I also played in a trio with him and Bill Bourne for years, Bop Ensemble. Um, but w- Wick and I came out here, and Al was opening up for us solo, and. <laughs> on this very stage, <laughs> I Al opened up for us, and then Wick and when I played, and we got Al to play along on the kick drum only, only kick drum for this whole I, set. No vocals. No vocals. No. He sat. He sat here, slumped in his chair, and put his hat, the brim down over his eyes, and just kicked that drum <laughs> <laughs> all night. And that was the first time. We played here yeah. together. That would have been in probably 2012. Is that your memory? Yeah, that that was the well. I mean, there was other things involved that skewed my memory a little bit that night. <laughs> but just to play a kick drum, it, you know, you can be quite dynamic with just a kick drum. But uh, it was it was great. Uh, Wickham Wickham's such a great songwriter, and. Uh, it was it was fun to see him kind of take his songs in a different direction, you know, because you know I, I, at that time I wasn't very good at rhythm, so uh, he wanted me to play the tambourine as well, and that was too much. That was, that, that was no, you can't do jobs. two things at once. Yeah. <laughs> and how many times have you played here as Blue Moon? Hmm, probably around ten to fifteen times, I'd say, over the years. Yeah. And the last time. The last time we played here was a quartet, I believe. We pl- we played a duo show before we went overseas. Often overseas, we'll still play as a duo. We don't do that much here anymore. But yeah, we, we played a band. played a du- big duo show before we went to Australia, and then we played a quartet show uh, with Darcy Phillips on the B three and Jerry Cook on yeah. the sax. Yeah. That is a quantum leap going from a duo to, to four. Now, people would look at it and say, well, you just added two musicians. But as a duo, you have to cover each other off. You have to, you have to actually move as one. Then you've got to make room for two other voices in there. Yeah, it's an incredibly difficult thing to play as a duo because there's no, first of all, there's no democracy. And uh, se- second of all, you, 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 when somebody messes up, you know exactly who it is. Uh, so there, it, it, it's hard, but also freeing because it, playing as a duo, you kind of connect and you, you know each other's uh, uh, intricate things that happen. But you start adding other people. Now, you have, like you said, you have to make other room. But well, there, there's a shorthand, too. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and so you, you're working with limitations, which, ha- which has its abilities and disabilities. Um, but adding more people is also freeing in a way because you have more people to lean lean on. You know <laughs> what I mean? That's very true. Also, the sound gets wider. Yeah. It gets bigger. Yeah. The sonic possibilities open wide up. And I, I got to say, the duo show, it's a lot different than a solo show because solo, you have all the freedom in the world. You can stretch, you can lean, you can, you can take a lot of liberties. As soon as there's another person there, you got to get that symbiotic relationship firing and and it it, it, but there's a tight magic to a duo that Mm -hmm. as soon as you start adding even one other person you kind of lose that because when there's just two of you and you're firing on all cylinders and you know every single nuance and turn there is like a very powerful unique sound to that to duos yeah but of course it is sonically limiting and it can get just downright boring playing that for years you know set after set after set it's just the two of you 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 want more you just you want more nuances in there you have to yeah you have to challenge yourself as well um did you two ever busk oh yeah yeah we did that's uh separately and together when we first started playing together in 2012 uh a friend of ours just sent us uh film film photographs from when he was, uh, uh, he came out one day and photographed us playing in um, in Gastown, oh, yeah. in Vancouver. Yeah. yeah. But we've we've bust as a band in in Montreal, and uh, you know, starting out, we we just 
we lived in the back of our truck, you know. We just hit the road and just decided that's what we were going to do. So we did everything we could do to make money from music. And busking was a great way to, to do that, you know. Um, yeah. I talked to Robert Finley, uh, who's this great blues guy that's come out of the South that, uh, that busked. And then bust his way into a, a blues festival and said, "Let me before you set up. Let me just uh, give me one song. Give me one song." It's, he's turned it into a career, and now Dan Auerbach from Black Keys is his producer. Nice. That's how, how far he's come. And I asked him, how, "How? What did busking do for you?" He said, "You get to know your audience. You get to know what works and what doesn't work." Did you? Yeah, absolutely. And you also you get this. Uh, this tough skin or this nonchalant like you don't nothing bothers you if people aren't paying attention you're still going to do the song you're still going to do the song you're not this snowflake that's all pressure oh don't you must listen to what i'm doing it's so very important you just play even if there's no one there and and you just get good at at honing that and also you know projecting and playing good like you're so exposed it's so raw and vulnerable. There's nowhere to hide out there. Yeah. So you, you cut yeah. your teeth quickly. You also know, in, in terms of songs out, you know exactly what's working for you. Yeah, and that's that's the thing. I like places like like that. Uh, busking helped me with that. But a, a place that really, like, I cut my teeth at was a place in Montreal called Grumpy's Bar, and that that place was uh, uh, relentless. Or, or you know, it, it, they they they. they on open mic nights, which is what I started there, it's called Drop the Gloves Open Mic. And uh, the bartender, his name was Ram, and he had a gong behind the stage. And if he didn't like what you were doing, he'd gong you off stage. So th- they would have uh, like three comedians, a musical act, and three comedians. So, like, uh, it, it, and the crowd is just, it's such a small room that they can overpower you with their conversation. Um, but once you figure out how to, you know, louder is not necessarily better um but when the audience does like what's happening there is a, 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 a it, it starts to quiet down and they start to pay attention they stop talking they start looking at you and you start figuring out how to do that how to how to draw them in like that you know rather than trying to overpower them you're trying to like bring them into your energy field or whatever you want to call it but uh yeah that that is a learning curve that that uh, you don't get in a place that is um uh you know, overly nice to you. You know, I, I'm I'm glad that I started out in a place that didn't really care who I was. You know, like you have to prove yourself, um, and, and that that builds a lot of character, I think, for a musician. Either you can handle it or you can't. You know, <laughs> and you know, and 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 the reason why I ask you sitting on this stage and asking you all these things about music and and just entertaining in general, is that you're not there now. You've moved on to a career and a future to look forward to. We're going to talk about the, this new album of yours, but really, I, I just want to say congratulations because for all of those folks out there listening who only ever get to see the lights on them and, and, the, and, the, and the, the applause, it's the road that got them here that makes them better when, they, when it finally hits. So where was that moment? Where was that one moment when you looked at each other and said, okay, we got something going? Ooh, that might be tricky to put a finger on. One moment. Um, I mean, so things like accolades and awards, they're, they're funny because especially coming up how we did, you know, we're kind of, we're like, a little bit from the gutter we're kind of dirtbag alberta kids you know and and we're, we started out with punk rock roots and metal and 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 hardcore roots and it was always kind of that was over there and that was the machine and the man and the glitz you know and it was like ah, i don't want that but then when you're in this for so long and you're you're working your bones out there you're like oh yeah i'll take one of those give, give me one of those that that would be nice actually to have people go we see you, we're picking up what you're throwing down, and, and we like it. Because often you're just, you're out there, especially in Canada, it's so difficult to be a touring musician in Canada, as you know. And, like, our friends in the States and Europe, they just cannot believe, like, 
the lengths we drive to get to the next gig. Exactly. The, the, the population's just not here. It's so spread out and it's so thin. So to try to, to, to try to, you know, driving eight, ten hours in between every gig and then you played for 40 people, like you're just, it's this kind of fleeting thing. Like, is anything happening? Are we making any ground? Are we doing anything? You know, and then to get, like, I think the first time we, we when we got all those maple blues awards that was something that was because they're like in this 27 year history nobody's ever taken all those top awards and and you guys did that and that was a real I mean all my life I thought and awards are not they don't define you and they don't you know they don't motivate you but they acknowledge they acknowledge you and they tip your hat to you and I think finally like because that always just kind of seemed it's like you're indie forever you know and you're just like down here but then all of a sudden you get a little bit of a nod and it's like oh wow okay that feels good you want to add to that well I I, I think uh, to pertain to your question um, I feel like the first time I felt like we had something was when we when we had formed the band Blue Moon Marquee and then and then we started playing in Grumpy's. We had a residency there at, at Grumpy's and then we, we started honing a sound. And then the songs that we were writing started to become a sound. And I think it was the first, uh, second record we did called Gypsy Blues. That, that, that is the record that I think started to define Blue Moon Marquis sound. And once we had that, it was just, it's a matter of time. Like I always say, it's, it's not a matter of how good you are in music it's just a matter of how long you're in the business for you know (laughs) like if you're if you're if you're pushing at it and and have the ambition and the and the goal to do it for long periods of time skill is going to come with that you know if but you can't you can't learn to keep ambition around and keep inspired i mean that's just something that you have or you don't have you know like through all the 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 hard times right i mean through all the the periods where where you, there are there is no recognition but you're still going out there and you're still doing it because you love it mm-hmm. and we would be doing that whether we had awards or we didn't you know but at some point in time when you do have recognition like that it's like ah oh, you know it, it's nice to be noticed you know there there's and it just gives you fuel to want to keep on going and keep doing it and keep say we all i guess we do have something going on here and people that people that do like it um so yeah you know that moment in the mask where jim carrey he's he does that take on sally field you love me you really love me i think about that
Did that sound find you, or did you find it? How did you cross that path? What? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, just, I don't Some, know. Sometimes I ask the question, when did you find your voice? you got to find a way, eh, that's your voice. How long did it take? I mean, those nights, those nights living in Montreal and honing our sound, busking in the day, we were just half living in our van, half living in various apartments that our friends would let us squat at we were kind of all really drifting and just traveling but finding our love our mutual love of really early kind of rare obscure blues but then also jazz like having a blues heart and a jazz mind or something that Mm -hmm. but then also we have this 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 um the energy of like growing up in rural alberta and punk rock roots you know but we also have the songwriter like we just had all these different aspects that we connected on and that's what i loved about montreal because montreal had has all of that you know it has it has the the like the punk scenes and and the infusion of like say bad uncle the band bad uncle and uh, they have a a very large uh a very well established gypsy jazz scene in montreal which i i love yeah i i when i lived there i i would go out I wouldn't have any money but I'd have enough money to go out and get a beer and and watch some of the best nothing better you know like Dennis Chang sitting right in front of me or you know uh, you know and and being in that rhythm of gypsy jazz you know that Mm -hmm. that really hard pumping rhythm of swing Mm -hmm. is is kind of really got into our style of music and yeah I think it's it's an accumulation of everything like I I mean I, I don't think there is one defining moment but uh, it, it's a, uh, it's it's uh, it's just a matter of whatever music bends our ear, you know, and then we just kind of try to incorporate that into our sound. Okay, which leads me to the reason why I came to the Osborne Bay Pub, that to talk about this this beautiful new album called New Orleans Sessions. I'm trying to remember who did the quote. It was one of the one of the great cranky authors in America. said said there's three music cities in in America. There's New York. There's San Francisco, there's New Orleans, everything else is Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love that. I wish I could credit it when credit is due. Yeah. So we're going to talk about that. The latest Blue Moon, by the way, when I typed the subject line in my, in my email, uh, I, I was in a hurry and I typed Blue Moo. Oh. So uh, <laughs> you're Blue Moo. Uh, Blue Moon Marquis, New Orleans Sessions. Uh, first of all, your name came up. It's on the top. New Orleans, my favorite town, music town, flat out. Um, whose idea was it to go and were you go looking specifically for a sound because there's lots of sounds in New Orleans and which one were you looking for uh, well we we first initially went down there for Folk Alliance right and uh, just felt, I, I mean Jasmine had been down there before I that was the first time I ever was there and I fell in love with the city you know i didn't ever want to leave um and when did we go back we jasmine probably knows better than i do well 
couple of years, we, we, did, we knew we wanted to capture, when you think about, you said there's such a dynamic variety of sounds in New Orleans, but at running, the vein running through all of them is the energy and the, it's just, it's in the air, it's in the water, it's in every alleyway, it's just in the vibe, it's in how people walk down the street. It comes out of windows as you walk by. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's in every single bar. Like, if you walk down Frenchman Street during the afternoon, you're going to hear all the music that we're, we've ever been influenced by being played by in every single bar with a rumba beat yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know it's just the, the whole city is 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 music that whole city is based off of, uh, of music it, it, it's tourism it's 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 lifeline is is music and jazz and um and that that swing rhythm you know it's it's there and then so we we got to hang out there and then we got to meet uh, big john atkinson uh, who I, I've been following for a long time because I, I love his music when he was out in on the West Coast um, playing with all those guys. I love his his writing, his his uh, his singing style, his, his playing style. Did you go into New Orleans with your tunes already written, or did you let the the, the city influence it? So so we so meeting Big John. So he's got the he's got the. Uh, recording studio down there and so we became friends with him and then so a year later we were said we're going to come down we would love to do some recording with you because he records to all analog gear and just gets a, such a great sound and that was probably one of the initial reasons why we wanted to record down there is because big john's studio we did uh, have the tunes. and then but we did have the tunes yeah they were they're pre We've been playing them a long time, the covers and stuff like that, but never have been recorded. And so it was a great opportunity to do that and ask John, hey, do you know of any players that we could get? And John said, yeah, I got piano players, I got saxophone players, you know. And he threw out some names and we just compiled this band. And that's the band that's on the on the record. I'm looking at the list here that I made at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, Trickster Coyote, that's you guys. Yeah. What I Wouldn't Do, you guys. Red Dust uh, Rising, yeah. you guys. Um, and uh, Some Old Day, also yours. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. And we, we wanted to capture that energy, just that there's a loose easy going but still just potent with the cadence and the 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 know-how of how to dance around the notes like it's just it's a sound like no other you can't find it anywhere else it's also the history it's yeah. Louis Armstrong and Big Spiderbeck and all those cats oh, yeah. Oh, yeah I mean uh, uh, you know uh, the drummer was saying that there's there's some guys that come down they record in New Orleans and the, and they say oh can you play more like a Nashville feel and the drummer says no you're in New Orleans I'm gonna play like we're why in New you, Orleans why would you come why would you go to New there? Orleans go to Nashville if you want a Nashville sound you know and so it's just like the drummers down there they know the feel and the and, and to have somebody that is steeped in that knowledge. Uh, to be able to just sit down and we went through the songs maybe two or three times together and then we recorded them you know these are these are such, some of the best musicians in the world they're playing four or five six sets a night every single night you know with some of the best musicians I've ever it's seen. like going to school yeah definitely yeah. every time we're down there it, it is it's so inspiring it kicks your ass it, and we just we're like we got we got to do this and we did this all on our own dime. This record was kind of for us. This mm -hmm. isn't the big polished follow-up to Scream, Holler, Howl. This was, we wanted something raw, rootsy. We didn't want a polished sound. We Live wanted like you're walking down the street and what you're going to hear in a room. Yeah. So we recorded this entire album in two days two afternoons completely live there are no overdubs everyone's sitting in a room together playing what was the democracy of when to move on <laughs> well usually uh john from the back control room would be like yeah and then we knew that we got a good take and we could move on <laughs> you can also feel it you know yeah. at, after you're done playing one everybody kind of together we'd be like oh yeah that that it was that any one. any one takes um, did we do? Oh yeah, with John. Yeah, I think I think Trickster yeah. Coyote was one take. Yeah. Yeah, uh, he just he, he said, "Come over this afternoon, and we'll jam." 
and I'll press the record and you did that and we we're like oh what song we should we do let's do this one and then it was uh, I think that was the, the that was first the take, take yeah, of that was... tune I'm trying to remember where I first heard the term trickster coyote, and I think it comes from carvers. I think some of the carvers in this area, that's that's what they were trying to carve, is that, yeah. that, that image. Yeah, it's, an, it's a native legend of the, of the trickster. It, it can either be coyote or, you know, uh, a, a raven can be considered a trickster. It's a spirit, you know. Uh, um, but that, yeah, that's... I, I like to incorporate that into my music because I'm uh, Cree, uh, from Beaver Lake Cree Nation is my band in, in Alberta, and I, I like to I like to incorporate those those stories because native stories are are, are phenomenal, and just the characters that are in them are, are great for blues music. Yeah. You know? Did you identify with the? Uh, I, I think of the Wild Chapatulas, the the chiefs, the Indian chiefs uh, in New Orleans. Yeah, yeah, we went and saw the in uh, the 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 Indian march. Uh, nice. Yeah, super, yeah, we yeah. went to a Super Sunday. Yeah, and there were some of the there's some of the the old old boys out there doing their last their last march. Yeah. So we we got to catch. Uh, oh yeah, it was just. I mean, there's <laughs> nothing there's nothing like it. Yeah. Just, yeah. Have you seen the documentary Rumble? Oh yes. Okay, so we we saw that and we were so we were floored. It's so well done, yeah. but that angle of the indigenous influence because people talk about the caribbean and south american with the black music down there and that's the mix but like much too often people do not talk about the native american influence because it's huge it's huge and it was it was uh, the holding everything together you know when the uh, when 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 the black folks you know even before liberation like if they would if they were lucky enough to escape or find a refuge it was native americans yeah. and so they were there you know living together making music together telling stories together for hundreds of years
And that's why we have Charlie Patton song on there, because yeah, nice. uh, you know if if you watch Rumble, you can see that um, what's her name sits P down. Pura Fay. Pura Fay sits down with uh, Charlie Patton yeah. and starts singing along because she's singing traditional native music, and she's like, "This is just Indian music," but he's playing guitar along yeah. with it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that was a mind. Uh, it was a revelation to me. It was like, "Oh wow," you know. Uh, that that rhythm and that beat and that singing style. Yeah. Yeah. You cover Memphis Mini uh, Lead Belly, Bo Carter. Now Bo Carter has got a number of a number of names, uh, yeah. Chat, Chapman. Chapman. But but basically, I I go back to the Mississippi Sheiks. Mississippi yeah, Sheiks. Yeah. 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 That, that band. Yeah, That's Mississippi right. Sheiks. But I first heard that song from a video of his brother Sam Chapman. Yeah. Is sitting in on the side of his uh, old creaky spring bed in this cabin playing, and he played that song "Let's Get Trunk Again," and and I, I fell in love with that. And he's Sam Chapman said that he was brothers with Charlie Patton as well, and I don't know if that's true, but that's what he said on the video. So, but yeah. Well, it's a long way back too. Uh, that's the first song I played off the album. Oh yeah. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, and. Alcohol can be a tricky thing to like, we're it not, is. yeah, and we're not waving any flags, you know, and we're not, you know, we, to the sober community, which actually we don't drink these days. So at, like, we're also, we're, you know, whatever works for you, as long as you're not har har harming yourself or uh, someone else, you know, sometimes it doesn't work for people, sometimes it does. But yeah. there's no denying that honky tonks, juke joints, venues, dives, the, Alcohol has been there alongside and kept live music. Um, the the it's been you know paid the bills. It's paid the bills yeah. exactly. It's been the like the life uh, yeah. a big part of the lifeline for wow. live music, and that's just an ode to these to these bars and these juke joints. I'm just trying to be you know loose and happy with it, and I hope people you know can just see that angle. We're not trying to push anything. All right, now thank you for that. Um, how many tunes did you guys write? Was it? I thought I saw seven, but I don't. Uh, I don't have them down. I got no. one, two, uh, I got one, two, three, four. Right? We have four or five originals on it. But the covers yeah. that we do do they that we do do they are. Um, <laughs> that we do do so they're, well. <laughs> <laughs> they're our own. I mean, Rendition. they're definitely quite different. Than are you writing people. together or separately? We write together. We write together a yeah. lot, uh, uh, like writing the music and the the forms and uh, the the feels of it a lot. Uh, we write write everything together. We run past like any song that we ever do. We're doing. We're running it together. Yeah, if we start one of us, one of us will start out with a a, a lick or a, a little melody or even a rhythm idea, and then we'll hash it out together. Yeah. I loved uh, Red Dust Rising. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that song we had recorded that on Scream Holler and Howl, yeah. and it it, it 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 wasn't really the way that I wanted to do it, and and when we came, that was that was on the second session we did we did that song, so I, I rewrote it, and if for it with this 
album in mind and with the band because we had recorded with them already down in new orleans mm -hmm. and so i knew what they were doing and i was like oh this would be a great fit because this is more the style that i really wanted uh that song to be because uh, it i think it really comes to life a little bit more hey Al, was there always going to be a lonnie johnson song on here <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. If 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 I just had to play Lonnie Johnson songs for the rest of my life, I would I would I would die happy. And why did you pick "You Got the Blues" so bad? It was uh, I initially heard this song, um, and this is the great reach of Lonnie Johnson. I heard this song from uh, a, a, a record of Blind John Davis uh, doing it. And so I didn't even know it was Lonnie Johnson's tunes till we started to do the research of it, and it came back to Lonnie Johnson and, and uh, uh, Victoria Spivy, and uh, and and they Spivy did that song. Um, so Lonnie Johnson, I don't think he ever did that. So I'm not too sure. I mean, I would I would love to hear it if if he did, but I think it was Victoria Spivy sang it. But Lonnie Johnson wrote it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you like singing Memphis Minnie? Oh, Memphis Minnie is just, uh, she gets me like no other. I, I think she's a definite unsung hero. She, you know, she was right along with, um, with Big Bill and, and like she can, she can really play. She had to be. She had to be. She had to be tough. Kid Lizzie Douglas, man. And she was known as being like, she carried her knife with her and she didn't take no BS from Because it was a, it was a man's world. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's right. But she she was such a pioneer in yeah. guitar, like one of the best guitar players, you know, taught a lot of people how to play guitar. Um, yeah, we got to visit her grave uh, when we were down there, right? Remember that? Yeah, and I, I believe it was Bonnie Raitt who put up for it to, for her tombstone and it's a it's a it's a beautiful little spot and yeah, the women of the blues really I I they're always always with me.
you kindly wrote me an email, and I love this here. We'd love to we'd love to talk about the new album, which comes out September the twenty seventh. Okay, tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. <laughs> um, we also have another exciting project we will be releasing in the spring, a very unique collaboration with Northern Cree. You want to run on that? Yeah, we we got to sit down with uh, Northern Cree in Edmonton and and go over some some songs. So going back to the documentary Rumble, uh, the the Native American influence in blues music how they kind of go together and and over the years i've heard i've found these few songs that really sound like powwow songs uh and so the the concept of this album is northern Cree came in and they're playing their drum and singing uh we had a charlie Patton tune on there um uh, and then you know i don't want to give it all away but a few other ones where where that's it's us in a room, me playing guitar and singing, and them on the the drum and singing, and and then we take some of these songs and put them into Cree, and we sing back and forth with each other, and it, it turns out it turned out really well. You are talking about two different musical keys for one thing, different just different even approach. Did, did it take a while to find the mix? Yeah, well, it's really hard because uh, you know native uh, drumming. Uh, and singing is not in 4-4, f- you, you know, so it's, it, it's, it, it does have its own, uh, its own uh, um, style to it and its own time signature, so, but I felt like we did really good, um, it, and these songs, they, they feel like they, they just go together. You, you know? got a working title? Uh, no, I don't. Not yet. Yeah. No, not yet. You got a time frame? Uh, Probably April we'll put it out. Um, we still need to mix it and add a few things, but I just, it was really fascinating to hear these two styles come together. Are you aware of a, of a, a artist named Snooks Eaglin? Yes, of course. Okay. Of so, course. So Memphis. that album, that album, New Orleans Street singer, performer, um, that, he's got such... A I mean, unique, so much funk, so yeah, much yeah, funk and yeah. style, and it. We were kind of really inspired by that, but then mixing it, yeah, with this powwow singing and drumming, and it is so. It was so powerful to witness to be in that room because I will. I will say, if you're being honest, they were a little bit hesitant to commit to this project because they've had people reach out to them before in the idea of a collaboration, and they said it did not go well. Yeah. Um, whether it's energy, people not quite getting what they do, but yeah. then also they ha- they add these extra bars. It's it's almost like you know, like Métis fiddle music. There's these extra, yeah, yeah. you yeah. know, and it's really hard for people. So they they've done a couple um, collaborations, and they said it it just was it was no no bueno, and it but didn't go good. Yeah. But with I, us, I think it, it worked like, out with with us because I I do that natural. I've always done that. I've always added extra bars it, you know with, on 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 blues tunes and stuff and jasmine has to you know you're adding again you, you know? adjust yeah. but i like you know? it i would but always encourage that's a natural it. thing for yeah. me to do and that's natural for me because that's that's part of me you know so i think for me to sit down with with northern cree cuz we're from the same treaty you know uh, and uh so it, it it just felt like like coming home and 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 taking what I my experience that I've gone through in my days and coming back and finding it and then playing music traditionally and mixing the two was such a magical experience. Okay, thank you, Al. Jazz, uh, you also said we have another project in the can, acoustic North Americana style tunes with Saint Daniel Lap on fiddle. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. We've, you know, both coming from a singer-songwriter background as well, we would um, sometimes, Al started it, playing our tunes that we've put out. But, you know, your songs get buried, especially so long ago. People don't hear them. And and a lot of time I find a song needs to live, it needs to live different lives until it finds where it really sits, you know. And um, so there are songs that we've released in the past, but unless you knew the lyrics, they are drastic. They're you would never recognize it at all That's and it's name. yeah and we did it um all acoustic so just upright bass guitar 
Dan Lapp on fiddle, Just and the upright, three of you? and upright piano, Darcy Phillips on the keys, and it is a riot and we talked about so like fun. we might i think we're gonna do a tour just as this you we, know? we might end up playing those songs the rest of our lives like it, <laughs> it might be the it, i don't know <laughs> you know you never know but it, it it's, it's it's a drastic difference i mean i think from from the normal blue moon marquee album that we do yeah. to this people might you know maybe but, maybe this is your new group blue moon yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> could, uh, <laughs> have a different name blue moon saloon or something yeah, yeah, yeah. um have you got a working title? We don't for that either, actually. You got a time frame? Uh, that will probably be in the late summer, because we'll release the Northern Cree album in spring, late summer, and then we're going to record the next, the, fo- the official follow-up to Scream, Holler, Howl in next winter. Apparently, you have time to tour. <laughs> uh, hold on a second. Let me just hold on a second. Yeah. One handing here. Once, once in a while. Uh, I started to see that. Oh, so it starts October the 26th, Festival Place, Sherwood Park, Alberta. That's right. Yeah, we're playing. We're playing. Uh, I think five or six shows around Alberta and heading into Saskatchewan for one, and coming back to the K Meek. And then, and, uh, sorry, sorry, but uh, you're going to hit the K Meek by the way, November two. I love that in West Van, yeah. and uh, TD Music Hall, that little little saloon in uh, in uh, Toronto. In well done. Um, <laughs> The Arden Theater. You start again. The Arden Theater. Uh, they've already started to promote it. Uh, April the fifth, and then you go, and then you go. Uh, uh, Slave Lake, Medicine Hat, Regina Nelson Trail, and you end up at the, <laughs> the Sid Williams and Courtney. Yeah, yeah that's right. We uh, we're probably going to be going down to the states a few times in between that as well. But those are yeah, those are the Canadian dates coming up, and we'll have this new album with us. So it's pretty thrilling. So when's the movie? Ooh. <laughs> Where's the documentary? Well, we do uh, we do have a short documentary online already called A Blue Moon Ballad. Okay. I don't yeah. know if you found that. But I haven't we, seen that. We made that during COVID. But um, we've been talking about this a lot because even before Blue Moon, we both had other projects and lived other lives. And there's we got to start uh, getting through this because a lot of I've been getting that question a lot. Where's the book? Where's the memoir? Where's the movie? Yeah. All right, the album's out now. Uh, what's your website? Bluemoonmarquee.com. Thank you both. Thank you for your music. Uh, thank you for the t- the tales that you can tell of, of your life to this point. And I'm, I'm for one, I'm just, I won't miss the rest of the story. I promise I'll be there. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Terry.